even what's called New Calvinism today. New Calvinism establishes the fact that you don't even have to confess Jesus as Savior uh, because since you're a part of the elect that you're going to be saved anyway. Uh, enormous, uh, enormous problems with that type of teaching, guys. Um, it is not about what we do. It is about what Christ has done. We know that to be, be certain. Uh, but you have to make that choice. You have to believe on him. You have to trust by faith uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And outside of that, guys, there is no salvation. Uh, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, there is no salvation. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ by faith uh, uh, died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and rose again, there is no salvation. So, uh, you know, if those that adhere to the Reformed theology that you are chosen and you are elect, uh, no matter what you decide or no matter what you adhere to, uh, they are wrong, guys. And so we want to understand that. So this Reformed theology is also known as covenant theology, and that's what it's based upon. That's what it's rooted into. Uh, it's identified as covenant theology. And I want us to look at the organizing principle of the covenant that they adhere to. Reformed theology began to identify itself as covenant theology because it organized its doctrine using the concept of a covenant. Covenant theology is a system of, of a theology which attempts to develop the history of the Bible and mankind on, two, uh, on the basis of two or three covenants, okay? Uh, the system of theology, this system of theology was developed uh, uh, in the Reformed churches throughout Switzerland and Germany. Then it was passed down into the Netherlands, uh, down into Scotland, and eventually into England, where it began to breed itself throughout uh, not only the British Isles, but throughout the world. In 1647, the Westminster Confessions of Faith in England uh, were the first confession of faith to refer to covenant theology. And then eventually, covenant theology was first introduced in America, primarily through the Puritans. Now, I, I speak of this, this a tier system, if you'll think on it like this. Um, when, the Reform, when the Reformation started under Martin Luther in 1517, on the 31st of October 1517, he nailed the 95 Thesis to the Gutenberg door, listing 95 things that he disagreed with the Pope and with the Catholic institution. So from this tier system, you have the Catholic institution, not the church, the institution, because that's what it is. It's not a church. Uh, so you have the Catholic institution, and then you have the Reformation period, the reformers that came out of that known as Protestants. Why? Because they were protesting. They, listen, the Baptists have never been protesters. We're not part of the Protestant church. We're not part of them at all. The Baptist doctrine, as we hold to it, and our Baptist distinctives dates all the way back uh, to the first century church, primarily, especially as Paul and Barnabas taught in Acts chapter 11 to the church at Antioch. So you have you have the Catholic institution, then you have the Reform movement, known as the Protestant movement under Martin Luther in 1517, and that, re that gave the birth to the Reformation movement. Now, from that, those Reformers, guys, uh, they were protesting against the, uh, the Catholic institution. Well, once the Reformation began to take way, and then you find the Confessions of Con Covenant Theology in 1647, the way, you have, uh, the way you have the Puritans bringing this same doctrine to the Americas, the Pur Puritans, as different as the Protestants, the Puritans, rather than coming out of the Church of England, all right, and uh, protest in the Church of England, anything like that, they remained inside of it and became known as Puritans. Puritans have done loads of writings, but they do write a Reformed theology, an incorrect theology, this covenant theology. But they believed they could purify the church as a whole from within. So instead of coming out because of the things that were being uh, taught and performed there, they believed they could purify it from within. And the same idea happened as they moved to America as began to teach of this particular type of doctrine. So many covenant the the theologians believe that the, they believe the children of the elect are a part of the covenant of grace. Uh, even if they are not saved and are never saved, they believe they're still part of that covenant of grace. Even if they actually die and die and go to hell. Some might use the, uh, the following scripture. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 7 in just a second. Uh, yet it has nothing to do with being part of a covenant, guys. Nothing to do. So make sure that you keep, when we read these verses, make sure you keep the whole passage in context of marriage and divorce of which it's pertaining to. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 13 through 15, the Bible says, And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. 
Verse 15 says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God called us to peace. Now, the context of those scriptures there has nothing to do with a covenant. It has everything to do with divorce. Speaking of divorce, divorce was to be avoided if at all possible. But since the believing woman in the case here would be a channel of God's grace into the marriage and into the family and in the one flesh relationship, the blessings of God, which came upon the Christian, also came upon uh, the family as a whole. You see two different uh, biblical examples. You see it uh, with Jacob and Laban's household in Genesis 30, verses 27. Laban's household was blessed because of Jacob, okay? Solely because Laban wasn't, I mean, there was nothing really good about Laban, but Laban has not, uh, his household was not blessed because of him, but blessed because of Jacob. You see it also when Joseph was taken into into bondage uh, in Potiphar's household, all right? Uh, Genesis 39, verse 5, we see that his household was blessed because of Joseph, okay? And eventually we see the whole nation of Egypt being blessed because of Joseph. So in this sense, uh, the unbelieving spout was sanctified, which means set apart for special blessings, and the children were holy, which means set apart for similar blessings, okay? but not saved. Okay, guys, God's blessings to the Christian home, if one party is saved, uh, born again of the blood of Christ in that home, um, uh, is the, the, all of those in the home will benefit from those blessings to a certain degree, but it doesn't mean they're saved. Uh, so that, that the idea of, of teaching covenant theology or adhering to a covenant theology in this sense, uh, trying to tie 1 Corinthians chapter 7 together with it, uh, is absolutely really ludicrous. It's uh, absolutely uh, nonsense. So the word, uh, the word for sanctify also can mean purify or means to be pure, uh, it's ceremonially set aside. The word unclean, which we found in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is the opposite of pure, meaning impure, but, and, and are not ceremonially set aside. All right, So you see that, how that works, and uh, they can twist that scripture to a certain degree to see uh, if they can adhere it to their doctrine. But that's the only way that covenant theologists and reformed theologists, the only way they really can make anything work for them is to twist Scripture to their own demise. So the covenants of redemption, works, and grace are the covenants that are looked upon uh, when we begin to address covenants and their idea. So it, this should not be con confused, guys, with the, with the biblical co covenants of the Noachian covenant, the, uh, the Abrionic covenant, the Daviatic covenant, uh, any or any new covenant. So when you begin to look at covenants as written in the Word of God, uh, you cannot confuse these three with those, those biblical covenants. Uh, it's a theological structure that was developed from a study where a general conclusion was made from the various covenants as to how they were structured. Covenant theologians differ on the number of covenants in their doctrine, some two, some say three, uh, but we're going to deal with three today uh, for, for lack of better time. So the covenant of redemption, within the covenant of redemption, uh, the parties that are involved is God the Father and God the Son. Uh, when was it established? The covenant of redemption, according to them, is established in eternity past. What was established? For the Father granted the Son to be head uh, and redeemer of the elect, and the Son agreed to suffer in place for the elect, knowing man would sin because of his omniscience. The Father provided redemption for the elect. Okay, so that's what it is. The covenant of redemption is based upon that idea that God the Father uh, provided redemption for the elect. How did he do that? The Son amends for the sins of Adam uh, and Adam's race. Uh, the, you know, keeping, uh, who, who was supposed to keep the law and uh, failed to do so. And thus, so the Son kept the law and therefore provided salvation. The Father promised the Son resurrection, the, the seed, and all authority in heaven and earth and great glory. All right, so that's the covenant of redemption. The covenant of works, uh, one of, another covenant that they deal with. The covenant of works deals with uh, the two parties involved is God and Adam. When was it established? It was established between the creation and fall of man. What was established? God made Adam the representative head of the human race so Adam could act for all his descendants. How? God required complete and perfect obedience from Adam, placed on probationary period to see whether he would willfully submit uh, to the will of God. And therefore, he would promise eternal life to Adam and the descendants if he obeyed. Adam failed, so he and the human race were penalized by death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Okay? So that's the covenant 
of works, all right? The covenant of grace, all right, and this is where we kind of hunker down, especially within covenant theology, uh, is established uh, because Adam violated the covenant of works. So those two go hand in hand. This is why you find that many uh, Reformed theologians or covenant theologians adhere to two and not three, two of these particular uh, covenants. The parties involved uh, was, the offended of God, was the offended God and the elect sinner. Those were the two body, parties. What was involved? God's prime promises of salvation through faith in Christ and the elect sinner accepts this believing and promise, uh, promising a life of faith and obedience. Now pay attention there. When the elect believe, according to their doctrine, when the elect believe, uh, uh, they're promising a life of faith and obedience unto Christ. So if they break that promise, but they're still the elect, according to them, salvation is still, uh, is still present. So it's not so much based on works, more on grace, but works are involved. The children of the regenerated are included in the covenant by virtue of their physical birth to the parents who are within this covenant. They may never be saved but they will enjoy some of the benefits. Uh, that's the notes that we looked at, accord, uh, thoughts on 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Again, guys, this is their doctrine, how they apply it uh, and twist it into their teaching. Uh, number four, guys, we find that covenant theology is based on the theory that God now has only one covenant with men, which is the covenant of grace, and only one people represented by the Old and New Testament saints. One people, one church, one plan, for all. That's what the covenant theology is based upon. It's based upon solely on this, really, the covenant of grace, and God has one people represented in both Old and New Testaments. Thus, they believe that Israel was the church in the Old Testament and that the church is Israel in the New Testament. Now, you notice how this, and we'll speak about this here a little bit later on, but this is the spiritualization of doctrine, the spiritualization of history, the spiritualization of prophecy to the nth degree. And you can see how people are so vitally confused on uh, salvation by grace, salvation uh, by faith through grace, or, or by grace through faith, uh, when they begin to adhere to this doctrine. Now, you may say, well, preacher, I don't believe that doctrine. I'm not a covenant theologist. I don't believe in the Reformed theology. I don't believe in any of those things. But you would be surprised that people today... And the things that they believe, many believe in amillennialism, all right? Well, that's a, that is rooted and grounded in Reformed theology. It's rooted and grounded in replacement theology because they remove the millennial given to the nation of Israel. Um, and, and so you would be surprised how many people believe to the tenets of this doctrine, yet they don't know where from whence they have come. It has, it has crept into churches. Guys, it's crept into good churches, all right? Really good churches uh, in this false teaching that we're trying to build a physical kingdom on this earth. Remember, there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. There's a spiritual kingdom. There's the kingdom of, of, of heaven. There's, this, there, there's this, the, the kingdom, of, of the literal kingdom of heaven, I mean, the, uh, this literal land grant for a thousand years will be lived upon this earth and beyond, okay? We'll talk about that actually on Sunday in our sermon. Then there's the kingdom of God, uh, which is that spiritual kingdom that you have uh, a saved, born-again individual. Um, so the promises of the land, uh, the descendants, and the blessings of Israel in the Old Testament have now been spiritualized and applied to the church in the New Testament because of Israel's unbelief and rejection of the Messiah. It's that simple. This is why you find um, this doctrine taken off like a whirlwind is because they essentially look at the penalization of the nation of Israel and say, God has written you a bill of divorcement, okay, and uh, he's done with you, and God's not done with them. Uh, God, it, God's, God protects His covenant. His covenant is eternal. The covenant that He gave to Abraham is eternal. It's going to continue to go on. The covenant is passed down to Jacob and to Isaac and the 12 tribes. It will continue on. Else you, don't, else you have no need for Daniel's 70th week, which we know is the tribulation period. Uh, the church is not part of the tribulation period. The church is not being uh, taken away or raptured out halfway through the tribulation period. There is no point, no need, no purpose for the church to be associated with the tribulation periods. If we were in the age, if we are not in the age of grace, uh, age of grace, then you could say, yeah, there's a point. But we are in the age of grace. We are in the church age at this present moment. We are in the final church age, known as the Laodicean church age. All right, the word Laodicea means rights of the people. We've never lived in a, a time in, in human history 
to where people have mo uh, more so-called rights. People are offended at the drop of a hat today. Uh, they believe they are entitled to more things than they are. And, and guys, to be honest with you, we're not even entitled to salvation. It's by God's grace that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, and it is by the moving of the Holy Spirit of God that pr convicts us of our eternal uh, salvation, our eternal need for salvation, our sinful state, and so that we can look on a Savior and freely accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay? Freely. Not forced upon. There's no glory to Jesus Christ who has made everything and all things consist if he forces you to believe on him. No glory at all uh, to that. And he doesn't do that, guys. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God is not going to force himself upon you. Okay? All right? If, if you reject the Holy Spirit of God, he'll go on about his business. Even those of you that are saved and born again by the blood of Christ today, having the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you from that very second that you accepted Christ as your Savior... Even you today, that if you, if you turn the Holy Spirit away from the convicting hand that he's placing upon you to lead you in a direction, he'll, 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 he'll gladly submit, and he'll take a step back, and he'll let you go out there and get yourself in trouble, but he'll always be there for you. Amen. So the effects, the, the effects of this covenant structure upon biblical interpretation, guys, um, is very damaging. It is a, it's, it, actually, damaging is a, a kind word. Um, most, one of the reasons that I teach and preach against uh, the use of tongues today, uh, the looking for signs and all this and that, is because it's rooted in this doctrine, okay? It's rooted in this. Even though uh, much of your, your charismatic and your Pentecostal churches uh, did not come out of the Protestant movement necessarily, they came out of sensationalized so-called revivals. Uh, when the Lord closed down the revival here in Wales in 1905, God was done with it then. It went from 04 to 05, um, and then God said, it's, it's time for this to stop and uh, for us to get in there and teach and to, to win people to Christ and to further the gospel. There was a massive group of people who wanted that sensationalism to continue on, and it gave birth to the charismatic movement within the United Kingdom. The same thing happened the very same year in 1906 in Azusa Street in North America. You saw the same thing happen there in California and Canada, all in the same year that gave birth uh, to this particular movement. And what was it rooted in? It's rooted in replacement theology. Because if you think that tongues and signs are for you today, you are a replacement the a theologian. That's what you are. They were not for you. Uh, they were given to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was established as a nation when they came out of Egypt. They were 12 tribes when they went into Egypt. 400 years later, they come out of Egypt being led by God's man, the deliverer, uh, Moses, who was given signs unto them for them to believe. That's why the nation was established. They seek after a sign. Paul himself says that the Jews seek after a sign. Uh, and the, I mean, I'm sorry, the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, Jesus Christ said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. So if you're looking for a sign and if you're speaking in tongues, which is only for a sign. Matter of fact, the Bible is clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22, that, that, that signs are given unto them uh, for, who, who believe not. So if you're here today and, and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you explain to me, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So I want you to ask yourself this question now, that if you believe speaking in tongues is biblical for you today, and you're doing it, and you're a believer, then tell, explain 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22. You cannot, okay? Because it's for unbelieving, and it was specifically for unbelieving Jews. In Acts chapter 2, there wasn't a Gentile around. There wasn't a Gentile present when, uh, Peter's, uh, when the cloven tongues fell upon Peter and he spoke in tongues. And what was that tongues that he spoke in? He was speaking in Hebrew and every man and woman, every Jew out there that were from dis different lands, that were part of the dysphoria, that was part of the scattering, when they came into Pentecost for that feast, that is 50 days after Passover, Penta 5, when they came into that feast and that Holy Spirit of God fell upon Peter, James, and John, and all of those, and they spoke in these tongues, it was miraculously translated from mouth to ear into that person's language of the day. It wasn't gibberish. Peter was speaking in his native tongue, and the men heard, uh, heard them in their native tongue, but they were all Jews. Look at it. You know, study it. Don't take my word for it. Read Acts chapter 2, and you decide for yourself. And then if you find differently, you contact me. That'd be fine. And, uh, but every time you see that these tongues were spoken of, a Jew was present. And that was the purpose. You find it nowhere in the Scripture that a Jew was not present because they required a sign, guys. And God brought an end to that. These are apostolic signs. 
The final apostle to die was the apostle John, who received the revelation on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, there is no, by the way, there's no apostolic uh, secession there when John's the final apostle that died. When he died, the apostles are gone and the apostolic signs with him. You say, well, my church teaches apostolic secession. Not out of the Holy Scriptures, they don't, because you're not going to find it in the Word of God. You're not going to find it at all. It's all rooted and grounded, guys, in replacement theology, which is rooted and grounded in Reformed theology. You say, well, I don't believe in Reformed theology. I don't believe in Calvinism. I don't believe in uh, the elect, uh, you know, the chosen frozen. I don't believe in that. Well, then you shouldn't believe in replacement theology because you can't have one without the other. You cannot remove Israel's millennial kingdom that is meant for them, okay, and replace the church there in the kingdom theology. You can't remove that without being a replacement theologist. And replacement theology did not come about until Reformed theology was developed. Think about that for just a second. Let that sink in for just a moment, uh, real long. Let that uh, kind of grab a hold of your heart, and maybe you can step back and begin to search things out with the Scriptures and to see where you're, you're, you're uh, falling in line with this. Uh, you, you don't want to have anything associated with any type of replacement theology, all right? You don't want to be in a, in, in, I, I won't go down that road. And uh, I'm not trying to be mean, guys. I'm not trying to be uh, arrogant. Uh, I'm just giving you biblical truth today, and I'm, I'm hoping and praying that you're not like those in Thessalonica, but you'll be like those in Berea that will go home and search the Scriptures and see if these things be so. Uh, remember, they were more noble in uh, uh, in Berea, uh, they searched the scriptures out and see if these things were so. Uh, the Thessalonians didn't like what they hear. They stuck, you know, these Jews, the unbelieving Jews, they stuck their fingers in the ears and they just abused Paul, ran them out of Dodge. Um, you know, so, so be more noble. Be a noble person and search the scriptures, see if they be so. And find out where you, where you have developed this doctrine. Now, yeah, I promise you guys, it's going to go all the way back to a reformed theology. It's going to go all the way back to a replacement theology, which develops anti-Semitism. If you think God is done with Israel, you become an anti-Semite. You become a, a racist person against the, the Jewish race, and that's just wrong. The Jewish race, guys, the Hebrews, they are, they are from the 12 tribes of, of Israel, all right, amen? The 12 tribes of Jacob, nowhere else, amen? Nowhere else. So where was I today? So there's an effect that covenant theology has on, on uh, biblical interpretation. And we're going to go over eight principles here, and that's where I'm going to stop for today. I'm going to stop there. We'll get into preterism uh, next week. I I was going to try to get to it today, but it's just too much information uh, to try to carry on with the time that we have allotted. I don't want to uh, uh, overwhelm you here this morning with this this, this information. But I do want you to take into account today, and I want you to take it in very heavily, uh, the proper biblical doctrine. Again, guys, uh, I'll go back to about apostolic succession. Let me say this one thing, and I'll be done. We'll move on to these eight principles. Uh, the effects that covenant theology has on the structures of biblical interpretation. Uh, The requirement of an apostle, biblically speaking, was to see the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul saw him. Paul received revelation from him. Um, You know, Peter, James, and John saw him. He appeared unto them. Um, That's the requirement, all right? Judas never saw him. Let that one think in for a while. So if that's the requirements, and you say, well, preacher, we believe in apostolic succession because the resurrected Jesus Christ has appeared to me uh, in a locker room or, you know, I was cooking pancakes one day and there he showed up, so now you're an apostle. That's a lie, all right? That's a lie for two reasons. Number one, uh, again, we keep coming back to this verse. I, Preston and I can't get, get away from it for some reason. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, but without faith it's impossible to please him, Okay. Uh, if, if Jesus Christ showed up to you in your house and you saw the resurrected Savior, you need no more faith whatsoever. You don't need an ounce of faith, and therefore you can't please God. If you can't please God, you serve no purpose on this earth. That's point number one. Uh, so you can't do that. It's, it's, it's untrue. Number two, we find that the Apostle Paul was called up to the third heaven, and he saw some things that Lord Willem will preach about on Sunday up there, a spectacular sight that he saw. But yet Paul says he, when he died in Lystra there and he was caught up to the third heaven, uh, he, he saw things that he wrote himself was unlawful for him to write, unlawful for him to speak about. Okay, So when he came back down here, he didn't start describing the things that he saw. He said he, went to, he, he knew a man above 14 years ago. Were there anybody out of body? I know not. But it was when he was caught up to the third heaven. Okay? And when he came back, you didn't see him writing a book about what he saw. You didn't see him writing a book, you know, his, you know, five, 15 seconds of fame or whatever it was. Again, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to make fun, but I'm just trying to give you biblical truths today that you can adhere to, that you make and correct or adjust your doctrine on why you believe what you believe. You're not believing it by sight. If you think you've seen something into a dream, that's all it was, was a dream. 
Uh, Paul himself did, listen, Paul himself said, and, 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 and guys, listen, Paul was a, was a greater man of God than anyone has ever lived after him or before him, all right? Outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul's the greatest missionary, the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of this earth. And I'm here to tell you today that he said that it was unlawful for him to write the things that he saw. It was unlawful for him to do that. So when somebody starts telling you that they saw Jesus Christ or they were called up into heaven and this is what they saw, doesn't line up with Scripture, they're lying. And they're lying for one purpose, to deceive you. And that deception is why this doctrine here has taken root. And again, we're coming down to the aspect, we're coming down to the aspect of replacement theology. So it's all rooted in replacement theology, which comes directly from Reformed theology. So quickly, guys, I want to go over uh, the effects that covenant theology has uh, on, the, uh, on biblical interpretation, the effects it has. Number one, the heart of the issue is hermeneutics, okay? Uh, hermeneutics is the is the uh, the science or the principles of interpreting the Bible. Uh, it is it, it is this element above all others which distinguishes the two schools of theology: covenant and dispensationalism. Dispensational theology is the biblical theology. Covenant theology is man made. Uh, what is a literal interpretation? Dr. David L. Cooper has, has phrased what, it, what, it, what is meant by literal interpretation in the following words. He said this. He said, the plain sense of the Scripture makes common sense. Seek no other. Or when the plain sense of the Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the context indicate clearly otherwise. See, that keeps you from spiritualizing things and making it a metaphor and making it, you know, into something that it's not when you don't understand it. If it guys, listen, when plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense, all right? So the literal approach should not be confused with, uh, say, the, the wooden liter- with wooden literalism, which takes every word in a strict wooden sense, allowing no room for symbolism or figures of speech. Again, common sense has to apply. Context of the Scripture is where we find it. The literal principle considers symbols and figures of speech to be normal parts of every single language. Symbols and figures of speech are are powerful communication uh, devices that tap into the mental uh, imagery of the reader. It happens. Yet when when employed, they are done so with the intent of communicating literal ideas. So a a symbolic phrase that you may use are used to communicate a literal idea. Think about that for a second. This is where people make such a grave mistake in, in baptismal regenerationalists, those who believe that water baptism saves a person. You go back to Acts chapter 238, where Peter says, you know, be baptized for the remission of your sins, right? Well, they take that and say, well, it's for the remission of your sins. Well, that's not what the word for in the English language, guys, which God by inspiration has translated and given unto us today from, from the original writings. Guys, that's not what necessarily the word for means. Have you ever heard somebody say, say the phrase, they stole for hunger? Well, they didn't steal to be hungry. They stole because they were hungry. You know, he laughed for joy. He didn't laugh to be joyful. He was laughing because he was joyful. So you're baptized as a result or because your sins, the remission of your sins, because your sins have been forgiven. That's what that means. And so you have to look at those things and how, uh, in biblical interpretation, how they're communicating, communicating literal ideas, even if it's utilized in a symbolic sense. So both both covenant theology and dispensational theology would say they hold to a literal interpretation, but they do, uh, but uh, do they, in, you know, consistently? Do they both, in a consistent manner, do so? Uh, the beliefs on page uh, on 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 what we looked at. Um, sorry, a minute ago, the the five principles that we looked at a moment ago, uh, the adherence to covenant theology, uh, they interpret prophecy in a non-literal manner. Reformed theology has established its own unique rules of biblical interpretation, which has been established through different confessions of faith, through different, uh, different synods, different communications, different uh, committees that men have sat down and agreed upon. Where they often use grammatical, historical, literal approach in many places, they depart from it when it comes to prophecy, and this is a problem. So when they look back in history and they see the literal aspect of the history when it looks into the future, they depart from that interpretation, and they do so quite greatly. Many of them, if not most or all, now judge that future events, especially in the book of Revelation, uh, have been fulfilled in the invasion of A.D. 70 upon Jerusalem, etc. That's a great example. 
So where they may look back at what happened with the events of Israel being uh, taken into Egypt and being under bondage for 400 years, they'll look at that and apply it in the literal sense. When they look forward into prophecy, they forsake that literal interpretation and say, nope, that's already happened. Well, guess what happens? When you do that, you remove the entire book of Revelation. You remove at least uh, the last uh, chapter beyond chapter 3 uh, a book of Revelation, period. I, I say you'd remove the whole book uh, necessarily if you say everything's fulfilled in A.D. 70, okay? Uh, then all of the things that occurred then supposedly uh, were fulfilled in, se- in A.D. 70, making all of that book metaphorical, making the entire book of Revelation nothing but symbolism. And that's an incorrect uh, biblical interpretation. Now, having said all that, I'm done. I just want to reiterate the fact that what you're looking at, we're looking at the problems of Reformed theology, Reformed theology gives birth to replacement theology. Replacement theology has given birth in a multitude of false teaching. Even those who don't believe a Reformed doctrine have hold to a replacement replacement doctrine and therefore develop an anti-Semitic mindset in their heart that God is completely done with Israel and God is completely done with with the Jews. So guys, that's part three today. Uh, we'll pick up with uh, Preterism uh, on next Wednesday, and we'll look at that, uh, that eschatolog- eschatological view. I think my tongue's tied up here a little bit this morning. I uh, hope and pray that you guys have enjoyed uh, this. hope you got a lot out of it. You should have the notes uh, at home now uh, with you. Again, if you don't have an access to a printer, please let me know. And if you have any questions on what we've taught this morning, please get in touch with me, and we'll go from there. But again, I say this, and we're going to close in prayer, our Bible study this morning. I'll say this real quick. Uh, Remember, uh, those in Berea were more noble than those that were in Thessalonica, and they searched the Scriptures to see if they were so. That's what I'm asking you to do. So before you write an email down or before you just disregard everything, uh, guys, get locked into your Bible. Study the Scriptures out and see if they're so. See if it adheres up there. Maybe you believe in tongues. Maybe you don't. Maybe you believe in uh, the pie in the sky. Maybe you believe in different things. Uh, that your preacher has taught you in the past, and you're holding on to those things. And uh, you may want to study, study it out and see who they're for. So I tell you, you know, if you can't get out of Acts chapter 2, get into 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and begin to answer some. Namely, I want you to answer verse 22. Uh, answer those things. See how that applies in your life and how it lines up doctrinally in your Christian belief today. Let's bow our heads if we will. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you for this opportunity to be together one with another. We pray now for that you would give us guidance, direction, and mercy. I pray that you'd open up the bowels of heaven. Uh, Lord, give our people uh, understanding throughout this Bible study. Whoever may join into this Bible study may partake in it. Father, I pray that at, at the very least, Lord, you'd bless their heart with a clarity of thought and clarity of understanding. Help them along the way, dear Lord, to see the problems with uh, a false doctrine being taught and how it trickles down uh, into communities and countries and throughout the world. Uh, Lord, deceiving and being deceived. Lord, I love you. I thank you, Lord. I pray for our families, Father. I pray for our church. I ask you to please help us continue to work steadfastly. Be prepared for our reopening day on the 26th. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much today for being with us. Remember, we have our fellowship this coming Friday uh, at 2.30 p.m. We are doing fellowship this week. Yeah. So we got fellowship this week, 2.30 p.m. via Zoom. And uh, so we'll be uh, going through our Kahoot, Kahoot uh, Bible and geographical game, whatever questions we'll come up with. Uh, Brother Preston comes up with some great ones. So uh, we'll be doing that Friday, guys. Join us back tonight, uh, 6 o'clock, for our evening Bible study as Brother Preston picks up and we'll be teaching this evening. I'm greatly uh, looking forward to that. Have yourself a blessed rest of your Wednesday. I love you guys. Look forward to seeing you soon.